Robert Young persuasively concludes that, and I quote, improbably therefore, biology and Egyptology together constituted the basis of the new, quote, scientific racial theory. These early views continue to influence popular culture and seemingly objective scholarship within both the US and Europe. For example, film directors and producers typically cast white actors of European ancestry to play ancient Egyptian historical figures and deities. Ridley Scott's recent film, Exodus Gods and Kings went farther, casting white actors for roles depicting the Egyptian elite, while actors of color were re relegated to the underclass. The English director was unapologetic when confronted with the racist implications of this decision, arguing that box office draw drove his decision making. However, many found this defense unpersuasive. In particular, Scott Mendelssohn pointed out forcefully in Forbes that the, knowledge, that the notion that he had to cast white actors for box office draw was overstated, noting there were suitable actors of color with greater recognizability who could have been cast. Scott's racialized depiction of ancient Egyptians with its white overclass and the black underclass resonates all too well with Morton Knott and Glidden's idea of a superior white master race ruling over an inferior black African underclass. Petrie, Dawson, and Emring's ideas of a dynastic master race surely all also draws from this early rhetoric, which remains embedded in Western views of ancient Egypt. This bias was illustrated in a modern scientific context by a recent DNA study in Nature Communications that received a great deal of press, unfortunately. They concluded that the foundational population of ancient Egypt was related not to other Africans, but rather to Middle Eastern peoples, contradicting modern genetic studies of contemporary Egyptians. They go on to posit that modern genetic ties between Egyptians and other Africans came with the medieval Arab slave trade. Nature's own publicity for this piece uh, reflects how deeply embedded this assumption is, even in the academy, and here it is here. Uh, and you know, we, here we have someone saying, how nice it is that this study now provided empirical evidence uh, for this assumption at the genetic level without even realizing that this completely begs uh, the question. The study was fundamentally flawed. The authors overgeneralized to all of the Egyptian, all of Egyptian history from a sample of only 90 individuals from a single poorly documented cemetery in northern Egypt, only three with a full genome. The burials date to the latest periods of Egyptian history. So how you extrapolate then back to the very dawn of Egyptian civilization is uh, puzzling at best. And all but, three or four in the, all but three or four individuals came from after 1000 BCE. They did not include any individuals from Southern Egypt or Nubia, something they admit as a weakness only at the very end of the article. They also conflate Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa, as well as assuming a haplotype that, that that is normally regarded as African is really Middle Eastern. Haplotypes are uh, groups of genes that tend to be inherited from parent to children and indicate population affinities. This was called out in peer review comments, but never adequately, adic adequately addressed by the authors. Additionally, they are oblivious to the fact that the mouth of the Fayum Oasis, where the sample was located, is well known through historical documents as an area where Middle Eastern people like the Sheridan were settled as a reward for military service during the late New Kingdom from about 1300 to 1070 BCE. This provides a far more likely explanation for any stronger affinity to Middle Eastern populations and weaker ties to Sub-Saharan populations that mo than modern Egyptians in their sample, but was not even considered. Even worse, they were completely oblivious to the long history of racism centered around the question like Petrie's dynastic race and the Hamitic hypothesis. So, to conclude, uh, the question of race in ancient Egypt is of great importance in modern society because of Egyptology's central and profoundly disturbing role in the creation of a theory of scientific racism that justified the worst kinds of discrimination, especially in, in America. Egyptologists might object that many Egyptians, like you see on the left here, Nubians on the right, uh, would disagree with this conclusion, and that's, that's correct, but my point is about American and European constructions of race. By modern American systems of racial classification, the ancient and modern Egyptians would both fall in the, into the category of black uh, African. As Anne Roth following Bruce Williams pointed out years ago, an ancient Egyptian transported to the American South in the days of segregation would not be allowed to sit at a Woolworths bar, would have to go to the back of the bus, would be barred from facilities reserved for whites. The same applies to most of the modern Egyptians and Nubians I know and have worked with. Uh, 
even though they might not self-identify that, that way, all the evidence points to a broad con continuity of both groups as Northeast African populations. And in the end, I'm the only person in this these two photographs who would be welcome at a lunch counter at Woolworths or would be allowed to sit in the front of, of the bus and not have to surrender my seat uh, to a white person. The power of acknowledging both Nubia and Egypt as African civilizations is that it destroys the logic of racism, especially American racism with its strongly polarizing view of blackness and whiteness drawn from slavery. Young observes percepti perceptively that, and I quote, Egypt is the earliest civilization developed in Africa, clearly represented the major potential stumbling block for the permanent inferiority of the black race, which it was alleged had never created or produced anything of value. Similarly, Trafton points out that this debate lies at the heart of the often polarizing back and forth between mainstream and Afrocentric Egyptology. A hierarchy of race like that developed by Morton, Knott, and Glidden, and still deployed today by white supremacists, cannot be sustained if not one but two black, great black civilizations arose in Africa at the dawn of history. It is therefore entirely appropriate and even necessary to confront constructions of race for Nubia and Egypt in the recent past and acknowledge both civilizations as African and black, Dis dispelling the myth of racial class classification and ranking that have their genesis with Glidden and the beginnings of American Egyptology. Thank you. <laughs>